Howdy, howdy, howdy. How are y'all doing, guys? Welcome to Cliff Notes Live episode, I don't know, 171, 172. Does it really matter at this point in time? A another episode of Cliff Notes Live. I hope y'all are doing fantastic. Welcome to a Monday evening. Is it the last Monday in March? You're just about, yeah, I think so. And then we got Easter coming up, so it's it's going to be a busy week. I sure appreciate y'all spending the evening with me. Y'all, it's a very special Cliff Notes Live, right? Uh, we got a very special guest. We're going to talk about her in just a second. But before we do that, I'd be remiss if I didn't start off with a big old SKD 143. Love my wife. Love my kids. Love reality TV. Especially love you guys that are out here watching this, uh, either live or on replay. I know we got a few folks that, that weren't able to make it this evening. I'll be watching it later. I haven't forgotten about y'all guys. Uh, just thank you. I, it's like a family out here, and I do appreciate it. Before I go any further, for those of you who maybe haven't, uh, please consider subscribing to my channel. Uh, turn on notifications. That way, whenever I drop an extra episode here or there, you'll know when it's showing up. And while you're out there, you know I like those thumbs up as well, so that's always appreciated. Uh, but more than anything else, I just appreciate y'all being out here with me. All right, with that being said, I don't want to take too long. Uh, but I do want to see who's out here and just give a quick old howdy and a quick old shout out. Uh, and, and while I'm doing that, y'all get y'all's questions ready. I know we got a few of them out here already. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, right off the bat, Lee Strack. Lee, how are you doing? Uh, Jake, the horror movie geek. Yeah, yeah I know you're going to watch on replay, but, but we'll miss you, Jake. Uh, Cindy Hire. Hey, Cindy. Miss Fire, Marilyn Sutherland. Uh, oh, y'all got all kinds of questions. All right. Kennedy Franklin as well. Brian Hostetler. Uh... Karen Loveland, Patricia Miller. Let's see who else. Y'all are just having a whole little conversation, aren't you? I'm going to have to go back after and read some of this up. Uh, Carol uh, Carol Mosher. Uh, Ma, welcome, Ma. How are you doing? How's school doing? JP out here as well. And Terry Thomas, Colleen. Angie Hung. Angie's already sent me a question as well uh, that I'll pick up here in a little bit. Uh, Karen Hummer and Nunez, 1919. Uh, Laura Lewis. Terry Atler and let's see, Amanda Lowe, LJ Price, and I think Kendra, uh, Terry Atler. I think I got you, Terry. That's all right. Lori Curry, Ed Brewer, and I think we will call it there. Welcome to those who are new to the show. Uh, welcome to those who maybe have been out here a time or two. Uh, just a little bit of ground rules before we bring out my my very special guest. Y'all know y'all know what Cliff Notes is all about, right? We're here to have fun on a Monday night. So we're going to keep things nice and positive, not hard uh, with, with this special guest. She, she had quite the run uh, on Big Brother 25. Uh, I, I think she surprised some people. Maybe she shouldn't have. Uh, but I want to welcome my very special guest. Uh, we'll get right into it from Big Brother 25, Bowie Jane. G'day, how's it going? <laughs> and I, I told Bowie before we started, I'm always happy when I hear the voice come on. Boy, Jane, welcome. Thank you so much. It's I don't have a lot of guests on this show. Uh, I think I, I like to hear myself talk perhaps so much, but uh, <laughs> it's nice to share it a little bit and share it with someone who's experienced some of the same things I did with the, uh, the Big Brother house. So welcome and thank you so much. No, I'm honored to be on your show because when I got off the show, the first thing my parents said to me was, We've been listening to Cliff Notes, um, so he's been keep, keeping us up to date with what was happening, and it was just so funny because I messaged you on Instagram. I was like, look, my parents are actual massive fans of you from your <laughs> – they said it was a very even sort of account of what was happening in the house, so that was good. I hope so. I mean, I try to be objective. I, I understand – I feel like once you've done the show, you understand maybe better than other people – the stresses, the the good times, the high times, the, the low times, the the fact that, yeah, the cameras maybe see a lot, but they don't see what goes through your brain exactly. when you're missing out on so many conversations and so paranoid about what's going on sometimes in that house. Yeah, and the whole thing, like, obviously, it would be good to speak to the cameras and um, let everyone, the audience know, I guess, what your plan is and what you're doing. But the problem is you're worried someone's going to come around the corner um, and may, you just don't know who's listening in. So it's just not worth it, quite frankly. And I uh, never worried about that. I had no, no I heard that you were doing it actually. I haven't seen your season, but I did hear that um, you talked to cameras. Corey talked to cameras. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, here's my story. If you haven't seen my season, uh, 
I week two or three, I was talking to cameras a lot. Every morning I would get up early, get a cup of coffee while everyone else was still asleep. So I thought uh, until one time I had a whole conversation to the cameras talking about <laughs> who I knew was aligned and working together. And sure yeah. enough, one of the one of the house guests, Christy Murphy, was listening outside the door. And the only thing that saved me is the only person in that house that had a bigger mouth than me was her. And she immediately <laughs> spilled the beans to everyone else. And so she kind of lost all the, the leverage that otherwise she could have held over me for, for a long time. Right. Uh, See, and, those little tiny moves make a big difference. I, I've had a lot of people say, what's the biggest key in the house? And, and I think you handled it pretty well, which was just, you don't know anyone an explanation. Just zip it and silence and secrets are golden and valuable. And you don't need Very. to tell everyone there. There's no... You don't owe anyone in that house an explanation or uh, knowledge about what you're going to do. And yeah. well, that sometimes was my. I did that, sometimes I didn't. <laughs> I mean, my plan was to, like, there were three. I thought there were three stages in the game which I needed to watch out for. And the first half of the game is where you've got to survive, and that's right. by not looking like a big threat, not being someone who gossips, um, be true to your word. I thought that would you know, get me through quite to at least the halfway mark. And um, and also not putting yourself in a position where you have to win a comp because once you start, once you're in that position because they want you out, then you have to win every week and then you're a threat right. and then you're gone. So it was, uh, we, we did close. I mean, I came in fourth, you came in third. I was in that house 93 days and it seemed like forever. Adding an extra week onto it, I don't know how it just drug on. I remember once we got into kind of those single digit days, uh, nine days left, then suddenly it started feeling, you saw the light at the end of the tunnel. You start thinking yeah. about your family and all that. But before that, I remember days waking up just thinking, oh, another day in this freaking house. Oh my God. Cause there's so much downtime and you know, that's what they want. They want you to go a bit crazy and to be like talking strategy when you've got nothing else to talk about. And all you do want to talk is strategy. Quite frankly, you get obsessed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but you've got to be careful about all that. So it's just, it's a really tricky game. People don't, if you haven't played it, you may not understand how it's a balancing act, every move, you know? And, and as you said, the, the production, doesn't go out of their way to calm your fears. It's just the opposite. Your brain starts spinning with every possible scenario, all the bad stuff. Then you get into the dire room and there's always the questions about, well, what would happen if this occurred? Or what? how much do you trust so-and-so? And it's like, well, I did until you asked me that question. That's exactly it. I know there were sometimes I was like, wait. Um, and I was like, no, don't let this, because you never know, is that true that they're thinking that? Or they're just putting a hypothetical out there? Like, But you do think after those diary rooms, you're like, why'd they say that? Or why'd they ask me that question? Yeah, I those diary rooms are killer. And I've had a lot of people that challenge me, say, oh, it's all scripted and all that. And they don't understand. It's not. We're in there no. playing our game and saying what we want to say. With with some of the people we had in my season and your season as well, they didn't need to script anything. There was plenty of drama and storylines uh, just all in of itself. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, it, it's definitely not scripted because, as you said, you've, they've got so many. I mean, the whole thing is in the casting, isn't it? Casting yeah. these crazy conflicting personalities um it, it's pretty amazing i was really impressed in the house at the production i just was always going even the timing of when they'd have certain comps and i was like isn't that great i knew it was great for tv i mean you don't really have a grasp that you're on tv but i was like this is a great production i tell you what they've done it for so many years they know what they're doing and so many people involved i i didn't realize until i got in we don't see any of them but i know back behind those windows and the production there's a lot of people focused on just showing the best and worst of us all the time now as far as big brother uh now first of all as far as auditioning and all that you had to be when they saw a, an attorney by day a dj by <laughs> night coming over from from australia you had to just be almost a golden ticket i would think as in terms of them wanting to grab you i can't imagine that they didn't grab you right off the bat, but you audition. I, they didn't have casting calls, right? Was it just sending in a video? Um, they did have a couple of open castings cause it had just come out of COVID really, I suppose. Um, but they, I sent in a video and, um, they, I live in LA, so there was going to be an open call in 
okay. West Hollywood, but I decided that I would prefer to do a video actually, just Great. so I could make sure I captured everything and not be under pressure with, I knew at those open calls, there'd be huge personalities and, you yeah. know, like uh, people who want to be on TV and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so I thought I'll send in a video. I did that. I made sure it was snappy, high energy. I'd researched a lot about, you know, how to get on the show, what people had talked about in castings, all that kind of stuff, and just put out the interesting parts, which is that I, you know, have worked in money laundering and tax fraud, but I'm also a DJ performer. And, um, and also I think, you know, being an older contestant, that's either a plus or a negative, but yeah. they did have a nice diverse cast for this one. So I I was so envious uh, of, of y'all going in. When I did my season, I was 54 when I was in the house and everyone else claimed to be under the age of 30. There was maybe one that was a little bit above that. But for All the right. most part, I was 20 plus years older than everyone else. Uh, it had to be a nice feeling that you got in. You weren't anywhere close. Uh, you're right there in the middle. Oh. It seems like. So in casting, though, like, you know, you prepared for the fact that you might be the oldest person on the show. And I was like, yep, doesn't worry me. Because, like, when I DJ, like, no one's asking my age. Or, you know, I've been performing for so long. I've been bartending. Everyone's, I guess everyone's younger, but it doesn't worry me at all. So I was like, whatever. Then I get in the house and I'm like, oh, wait, I'm not the oldest person here. What the hell? And I'd already started my life. So I had to run with yeah. it. I was like, well, I'm just going to stick with it because also – being older, is that something they might evict me for? They go, well, she's not going to win comps for us, you know? Yeah. So it, I thought maybe let's just stick with the median age, you know? Yeah, well, and you never know. And once you get past those first few weeks where they potentially would target you just because of your age, then... Then it's fine. Yeah. But yeah, Brian Hosteller to ask about the uh, uh, how you auditioned. Uh, Cindy Heyer was asking, I'll do this real quick. Any tips that you have if you're going to send in a video? I did a casting call, but you sent in a video. Any you talked about being high energy and all that. If you had just one or two things to, because it's casting season right now. Yeah, and I Look, know we I, all get that's that's a lot. What's your your pointers? I think you need to show that you're going to be interesting in the diary room, yeah. um, and also you need to be like everyone says. Oh, you got to be true to yourself, and that is a hundred percent true. They don't want to see you putting on uh, an act or looking like an influencer. They're not interested in people who are, are probably performers, even though I am, but like not someone who just wants to be on TV for the sake of being on TV. Yeah. Like they want people who want to play the game. So you need to talk about the fact that you've watched Big Brother, that you, you know, you understand the game. You understand, I, like I studied it so much before going on the show. So you need to tell them that and also give yeah. them the little points about, the interesting points in your life, and that might be that you're a, a mum with four kids um, and that it's been a struggle. That might be your point of interest, you know. So, like, and especially with the cast being so diverse now, I think oh, just yeah. pick out the parts of your life that make you crazy. Well, and, and that's what I've said. Very similar. I've said figure out what makes you stand out from the 10,000 other people that are trying to get on the show. Figure out what it is. Don't lie about it, but you can certainly – focus on it and and make sure that they're aware of it and all that. And then the other thing, you've got to be able to carry on a conversation because that's what the show's all about. That's right. Yeah, you have to be confident talking to camera and, you know, um, just not being afraid to, like, look, I never said in my interviews, I'm going to be nasty and I'm going to do this. I literally said what my strategy was going to be and I stuck to it. So I said that in casting. They knew what type I was. They're probably like, oh, she wants to make friends in there. What an idiot. Um, and <laughs> like I was saying that in my casting and I was also saying in my casting, look, I think I can make some good friends in there and I know that you probably think I'm an idiot, but I really think. And so all yeah. those things were honest and true to me, you know. And I did the same thing. All right, I got a little little secret for you that was fun. When I did, I did a casting call, and they brought us in in a group of five people and asked out each of us just a real quick question. Mine was, why do you think you'd be good at Big Brother? Or why would we want to have you in the house? I said, I've been all over the world. I've got 100 stories to tell and this and that. But the very last person that auditioned in our little group was the DJ that had been playing music all day long at the casting call. Oh, you're he, joking. He spent two or three minutes talking about exactly the music he listened to. I listened to beat music between 120 and 130 beats a minute and going into all this detail and just on and on. And he got done. I looked over and said, that's exactly the same music I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> and he um, looked at me like, you are the, the biggest goofball in the world. But, uh, <laughs> apparently it worked. You've got to be able to interact with anyone and... Uh, yeah, and yeah. with the open casting calls, do you are you speaking in front of the group? 
or are you doing it individuals? Yeah, yeah it, it was all a matter of showing up. They brought us in little groups of five and we just kind of went around the circle with everyone being asked a question. And yeah, so it, right. It so it's not off. very private, is it? Like, no, yeah. Which it the pays house off for those who may be showing up at a casting call. It pays off to be hanging out and getting to know the people in front of you and behind you in line because they may be your best friend or your best enemy once you get in and start talking in front of those casting folks. Yeah, so, that's right. So, so, so are you, you talk about being a fan and studying Big Brother USA. Were you a fan of Big Brother Australia? I think I read somewhere that you'd watch that as well. Yeah, so Big Brother Australia, when it first came out, was huge in Australia, but it was yeah. the audience voted, so it's essentially a popularity contest. Um, the comps, I don't remember there being comps, to be honest. It's completely different. It's not like Survivor or anything. Um, so, no, I don't remember there being alliances, but it was heaps of fun to watch. And, um, yeah, it was about how to, how to be, I guess, it showed people were annoying on camera. They couldn't help it. They got voted off. So, um, but then coming on, knowing I wanted to go on the, well, I'd already watched a few series of um, the American version, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow this is hardcore it is strategic it's basically survivor <laughs> on 11 like it's hardcore so i thought i will um i i listened to every breakdown podcast there was people every contestant who'd been interviewed for the last few years i listened okay. to them talk about their strategy in the game and the things they did wrong and some of those podcasts are like two hours long so i just listened and watched and watched and watched and i felt ready to when i went in and i it wasn't any different to what i expected no, that's good I reached out and talked to a few of the people on Big Brother Australia from three years ago, I guess, I, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, I know one guy, Kieran Davidson, had reached out to me and said, hey, Cliff, if I ever wanted to get on Big Brother USA, what do I need to do? I said, well, Kieran, I think you're in trouble because you have to be a U.S. citizen. He exactly. Said, oh, okay, never mind. You figured it out. <laughs> you made yeah, it so work. Five years ago, I wanted to go on the show and I was stopped pretty much at the gate because it was like, are you a citizen? No. So when I became a citizen which was february last year i applied a week after getting it okay that's uh yeah i i knew, I knew they'd want you now why when you came over because you just became a u.s citizen right before you went on the show i think that's what you said did you come over for the music or for the law or just for so, well so i've been um doing the music and the law for a long time um but i've been concentrating on the music for the last uh, i've been in la for nine years and i did well eight years um so i did move to la for the music okay. and before that i've been in the uk but um to get a bit closer to america with my songwriting and all that, that kind of stuff i was doing uh, i worked in bermuda on the bernie madoff litigation so <laughs> oh, wow. um so that was as close as I could get to um, America without it because it's Commonwealth jurisdiction. So I yeah. had to work. I'm only registered to work in Commonwealth. Um, so, yeah, so I've lived in America, worked there, for, um, moved to America for music and have been pursuing that, which is why I've done some bartending as well because uh, I'm not registered to work as a lawyer in America. Okay. All right. I, I got to say, when, you're, when they revealed the cast and your name came up in your interview uh, and description, you really were, a, I, I wasn't sure what to think of you. I mean, because you're such a, uh, is dichotomy the wrong, right word? Yeah, the, the, the variation between the, the legal and the music and everything else. I, I saw that you put down that you're a barrister and I, all I could think of is it's just a Starbucks barista. That's a bad I No, I was like, no one's going to know what barrister is. So like, I was like, why did they do that? But I guess I knew what they were doing with it. I don't know. <laughs> I added a little mystery and intrigue to the whole deal. You right. Were, okay. You truly were an unknown, and I got to say, really through the first few weeks, production probably didn't do you a whole, a whole lot of favors either because there were so many other people with these huge storylines with Sari and Jared mm -hmm. being related and people just painting these big targets on their back. You just didn't get as much, didn't seem like there was as much diary room or, or conversations or, or any yep. consideration. So it was just hard to figure out whether you were just kind of in there just just to be there or or you know how how actively you were planning out what was going on over those first few weeks because you just didn't get a lot of screen time until you start being a little bit more a cog in the machine as people started well, imploding some and the thing is i was very much involved in all the conversations and all that kind of stuff but giving everyone the impression on purpose that i'm a happy go lucky girl yeah. i'm cool to go whatever your strategy is which isn't true but like 
just to get through those first few weeks. So I was well aware that these people who are being crazy in the house, and I can see them all being crazy, by the way. I'm like, yeah. they are not going to last long in the game. Like, you know, it's not how you, if you want to just blow things up, you'll be out in week one, two, three or four, you know? So, yeah. um, and I, I knew that that would happen. I, it's a long game. You got, you almost playing the long game. So you have to just ride it out and start to imprint your strategy as you're going a little bit by little bit. I don't know how you did it because uh, my season, we had one huge alliance of, of eight or nine people. I was in on the outside. So my strategy for the first four or five weeks was just survive. I don't care yeah. who else I have to throw under the bus. Hopefully not anyone I really like, but I just have to survive because eventually that group's going to blow up. But I knew yeah. it was just a matter of attrition and, and trying to make it to the end. You, on the other hand, it seems like there was a new alliance forming every other day. I couldn't, oh. I was trying to cover it. I couldn't keep up with them. I don't know how in the house you would keep up with who was serious, who wasn't, if anyone was with all those alliances well it was outrageous actually so in my experience from watching the multiple seasons i've watched it's like there's usually one or two major alliances breakdowns within the alliances but that's about it my season i was like what the hell so i was in um the professors then <laughs> they started Sari and well i think it was easy we wanted to vote out hysem and i was yeah. like but he's in our alliance. <laughs> like, why wouldn't we go for someone on the other side? Of course, not knowing that they're in all, there's all these alliances going on. So I think when Jared and Corey had that fight in the have not room, yeah. which was awesome. Like I was there taking notes pretty much in my head going, oh my God, this is very valuable information. That there's 300 alliances. No wonder this felt like an absolute, like shit show, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it was full on. We both had the similar, like that kind of aha moment. Yours when they're up there, Corey and, and Jared are doing their thing. Mine, right after one of the votes, when they start, my this big alliance starts going after each other, just jawing at each other in the downstairs room by the bathroom. Well, I guess it was y'all's gym, but back then it was a boat room. Anyway, and they're going on and on. And I, I just know it's finally happening. They're going to go after each other. And at one point, I looked up the camera and said, I love Big Brother. This is so great. <laughs> It was just that you knew that you had made it past, as you said, maybe that first stage of just trying to survive. And and now there were so many big prime targets out there that, that you could maybe take a little more control and be more, more proactive, uh, I guess, in terms of some of what you were doing. Yeah. And also, like when I got blindsided, that was really a blessing because those people weren't going to be loyal to me at all. So um, it really showed their true colors really early on. It allowed me then to pretend that I was cool with it, but I wasn't, and um, move on and find other people to work with. So it gave me that because I would have, I was so loyal, I would have stuck to them. But to me, it was um, right, you've let me go, great. I can now move on and work with um, people who are more loyal. And they were, the others were way more loyal. Yeah. And I remember exactly when it happened. I re it's so hard watching. I, now that I've done the show oh, and now, yeah. that I've, now that I've watched other people, I realize it's so much harder to be watching people that you're cheering for and not be able to do anything about it. Uh, to have you come into a room right after there's a little bad mouthing of oh Bowie Jane. And then suddenly next thing you know, you're in there and they're just friendliest people in the world and all. Oh that. yeah. Like I, I haven't watched it, but I've been tagged in all the, I guess, nasty stuff and people were super nasty in the house and it's unnecessary in my opinion to be, I mean, do whatever you want, but you're not going to last are you? So um, I had the last laugh in the end. So there you go. You know. There you go. All right. Question. Uh, but also to... one, one other thing. Um, oh shit. I forgot what I was going to say. No, you keep going. I'll, oh, I'll think about that. Uh, I'll Brian Hostetler, Mark Taylor saying, uh, what was the hardest thing about being in the house? Uh, well, um, I found the experience not hard. Like I've, it's been weirder coming out and looking back at it and thinking, Oh my God, how did I think that was normal? You just, as a human, I think deal with things as they're coming. And um, yeah. so I didn't find it difficult. The thing I really, really hated was the gym was so small that uh, uh, there was no music to listen to when you work out. Now, you, I didn't even think of that. The fact that you got to work out in silence is, right. and it's sort of soundproofed in there, as you know, so it's like terrible, terrible. So I'd say the working out's annoying. I, at least y'all had a place to work out indoors. And you know me, the buff, you know, workout king and all that. But <laughs> all we had were some janky bicycles out in the backyard a couple of barbells to work with uh, they kind of upgraded with y'all which uh, which was kind of nice 
but talking about the music and all that you're i mean you're so involved in music just missing out on the music and and all, everything for those who don't know they play i assume they still do it you get two or three songs in the morning to help wake you up did they ever like throw you a little bone and give you a little techno music or something that that <laughs> would get your 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 blood pumping a little bit more than than the standard old beach boys or, or some of the things they played well, the first song they played on the very first day of what a that first day when you wake up is just wild. Like you've been up all night chatting. It's wild. That song comes on and it was Dance by Dua Lipa, the um, one that's in the Barbie movie. Okay. But of course, we didn't even know the Barbie movie was out. So we didn't, I was like, this sounds like Dua Lipa. And like, I will never forget that song for that. <laughs> but yeah, no, they didn't throw me any bones with dance music and they didn't throw me any bones with Aussie music despite me requesting it. And on a couple of the days I played some really, like, disgusting, almost really loud and distorted. And I was like, the music's distorted, but I read somewhere that they do that on purpose to sort of make you have a bad day. I don't oh, know really? if that's true. Yeah. Hey, I wouldn't put it <laughs> past them. All right. Now, let, while we're thinking about it, let me give you my little conspiracy theory and see what you think about it. When I was in the house during the – while we first were in there, it was so hot. I hated it. I, I could either sleep with blankets pulled up on me and, and be miserably hot or just sleep in nothing but my skivvies and, and just be more casual, but then have the camera pointing at me all night long. It was miserable hot until September and suddenly it got cold in there and we were wearing hoodies and everything else. And my conspiracy theory is that production turned down the thermostat and make it colder so we would start dressing differently as we got into the, the fall season for all the viewers and everything else. Uh, but y'all were a little different because y'all started so much later. You were well into the fall throughout the whole, the whole yeah. time. Was, was it cold We're, for y'all or were you hot? Oh, I guess we went in, in, in August, but it was still stinking hot outside. Right. Okay. But, um, it was freezing in the house, like unbearably cold, really. Ugh. Um, so I brought this, that big jacket in, thank God. But the reason I brought the big jacket in is because I thought, well, last season they made them sleep in the backyard yeah. that will give me like a sleeping bag situation so if it there's that so in my head that was like i'll oh, bring that that's a good tactic like <laughs> um but yeah it was exactly freezing freezing yeah y'all even had a tropical storm while y'all were in and locked in for a while with uh, the <laughs> rain and everything. i don't think it rained a single time of course you don't know because you're locked inside for so long and people don't understand what that does to your psyche when you only get oh. those couple of days a week outdoors Oh, that was probably the hardest part actually is not having outdoor access so it was just um like sometimes it was two weeks without outdoor access and your skin gets really dry in that air conditioning and um you get used to it actually but when you come out you're like oh, i don't want to do that again <laughs> yeah yeah i i feel sorry i bet i bet the air in there was so stale for the people that weren't used to it it was a uh, uh, yeah grow adjusted and, and used to to really weird conditions. I can't believe we put ourselves through it, especially, I mean, some young someone that does it just out of school, whatever. But the fact that you had studied law, a very analytical type of, of position, I'm an engineer myself, so so fairly logical. Not. Do you think that helped you in terms of playing the game and kind of keeping things focused and steady? Because I know it's so easy for your emotions to just spin out a check, but I really tried to focus from my side on the analytical and and, and keeping that in, in check as I went through. Yeah, I think especially after the blind side, um, the fact that because I'm used to like you used to being told off in court by judges, you know, where's this document when it's, it's often not your fault, but, you know, where's this and why isn't this being done? Sorry, my client, blah, blah, blah. You used to having to just keep a pretty straight emotions um, and not, not let your emotions get involved at all in court. And I'm used to speaking publicly as well. So I think that did help me. As far as analyzing strategy for the game, yes, but that's I naturally do have always done that in my life. So, but yeah, like looking for like no understanding people's behaviors. And I think being a lawyer, especially someone who works in litigation, so I'm used to cross examining, getting oh. information out of people. So yeah, that all of that stuff definitely helps even if i don't realize it was helping we were robbed i would have loved to have seen your final two speech and see how mm. you would have just raked jag or, or matt over the call not over the calls i'm sure you would have done just been perfectly nice and all but uh, the arguments you would have made i would have loved to have seen how they uh how they kicked in yeah i'd been planting seeds with the jury um like i had a little bit of a 
strategy with it without it being obvious. So planting seeds about, oh, this is the strategy I've done over the game. I was letting Felicia know because I knew she was going to be going next. So I thought yes. when she goes, that's going to be fed through the house because she, she'll say, well, Bowie said blah, blah, blah. Then they'll all discuss it. So um, I just wanted people to know that I had been playing the game because that was going to be what I knew because I hadn't been talking about it. They were going to accuse me of not playing the game and that yeah. would be my downfall for the final two. Um, so I thought it's very important to make sure um, I explain all my strategy and also the fact that I've won three head of households um, it is a good thing and a bad thing because does the person want to take you to the final two because you've won so many head of households? It gets to that point where you're like in trouble with it, you know? It's a tough balancing act, isn't it? Yeah. Right. A couple of comments from uh, a couple of your fans out here. Uh, Ed Brewer saying, we love you, Bowie Jane. You were robbed. You should have won. And <laughs> Thank you. Karen Hummer saying, agree, Team Bowie Jane. So, Yay! And and I agree. You, you, you killed it. I mean, you really... And Angie Hung had asked me a question earlier about, uh, I know the idea has been floated around, uh, float, uh, admit, but uh, uh, about this idea of a floater and were you a floater playing the game as opposed to, you know, I guess it's, were you reactive or proactive in the way that you, you played the game? And as I mentioned before, the first few weeks weren't real kind in terms of showing us which that yeah. was going, but, but what yeah. do you say to that? I mean, I there's no way. I, I don't know how anyone could go into this game, especially as a lawyer, without a strategy and to be thinking strategy the entire time. So um, it may the I wanted to give the impression I was floating. That was a hundred percent my goal because I thought I would be seen as less of a threat. And the reality is, if I gave away all my plans, like I would have been yeah. gone. They would have been like, you know, she knows what she's doing. She's got anyone who looked a bit smart. We're all like, well, they've got to go. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So as far as floating, uh, yeah, that was my impression to give that impression uh, my intention to give that impression. Yeah. And it absolutely was not the case because yeah, every move I was making from walking into the bedroom with Sari, because I knew that alliances formed from the bedroom, that meant I was going to be in with someone who's probably going to be quite powerful in the game. Yeah. Um, and just like also training, doing the gym with certain people, the little, I was planting seeds all over the shop for the long game. Yeah, uh, there you go. You can have a strategy and build on that without being real obvious about it. Yeah. I, I do think there's something to be said for also being flexible. I, as you talked about, you may have been loyal to some of these people until it became obvious they weren't loyal to you. You can't, at that point, you've got to be willing to kind of flip around a little bit and, and do what it takes. But uh, yeah, you got to pivot. Great. And I was in alliances the whole time, whether, pe whether they showed that, I don't know, but um, I've been, I was in alliances for probably a couple of days where I wasn't in an alliance. And then yeah, I mean, we rotated for those last six weeks and won every comp. So, like, you know, it worked, our strategy. And I love it because looking back, uh, at first you were in with uh, the Bye Bye B, eh? three and Felicia and all the girls, I guess, to some degree. But then all of a sudden you're, you're working with Cameron and, and next thing you know, Cameron's gone and you're working with Jag. And you certainly showed flexibility of, of being able to, to work with the people who – because there were certainly power swings throughout that season, uh, yeah, uh, different groups, and you always seem to be landing on the uh, uh, the right side of it, which not everyone can do. I mean, yeah, and then the moment I heard from a few, I think from Corey, he let me in that you know your name is being thrown around as a pawn, and I go, cool. Well, um, just so you know, if that if I do get put up as a pawn, and you know I'm probably going to win the comp, then I am going to um, put that person up for nomination. Just so you know, and mm -hmm. I, that was a risk to say that to him, but I figured it would filter through that. She's actually, she's happy-go-lucky, but she's not going to be cool being a pawn. Yeah. Um, and the risk of saying that is, oh, let's put her up then because she's going to turn on us. But I th thought with him it was okay to say. It is up playing a game where the smallest, tiny little thing that you say incorrectly can just come back and, and burn you. And, and you say something, then you spend the next 48 hours wondering, did I just blow my game and, and all of that? Yeah. Uh, but quite, and actually, the thing I've, I've remembered before what I was going to say i don't think they showed it but when the izzy izzy was being evicted yeah. um they i knew we had the numbers in the house and jared took me into the storage room i don't know if they showed this and said here are the numbers it's you're the decider and i said cool izzy's going and he goes okay and he went out and told the house and i followed him around to each of the rooms and said out, out loud i go hey guys i just let you know i'm voting for izzy to go because if i'm the decider i'm gonna let the whole house know and yeah. so I went around to all the rooms with him to tell them and so that he couldn't lie and say I said something else. Yeah, Jared lied. <laughs> Why would he ever do that? So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I was pleased with that.
I think that's brilliant. I don't remember them saying that. That was probably sometimes you yeah, get right up there towards it. the eviction and they're so busy getting ready for the live episode and all of yeah. that. Uh, Lori Curry is saying, uh, good day, boy. Uh, good day. Uh, she said that we talked about your, your maybe your least favorite. What was your favorite part of, of Big Brother and being in that house? Uh, my favorite part was being with people all day, believe it or not, and getting to chat with them without phones and no mm -hmm. other distractions. Like I was so hectic going into the house. And when I got in there, I was like, yes, time to relax. So, you know, I've got a podcast. I had to pre-record everything. You don't know if you're going on the show. Like it's so yeah. hard. Um, but yeah, so I think probably I enjoyed the human interaction and just, it's a, it's a study on human behavior, isn't it? It's yeah. There's such a diverse group in there in turn, not just in ethnicity, but the people and what they do, where they are so much stuff. I, I loved it. It was fantastic. And I, I've met people, not even just with the show, but uh, the, the cast, but then afterwards people, this show yeah. and else. So many friends that I've developed now that I would have never met if it hadn't been for for Big Brother. So, yeah, there's a real a, um, old like a camaraderie, isn't there, with the yeah. people who've been on the show? Everyone reaches out, you know. Well, and I was gonna ask that because with y'all going so much later in the season than is typical for Big Brother and Hearts of Reality, the big fundraiser where a lot of the reality people get together in December was canceled this year, so we weren't able to do that. Have you had a chance to? To, to hang out with with people from other reality shows, other seasons, Survivor, things like that? Or are you so busy yeah. just traveling around the world that maybe not so much? <laughs> well, I do travel a bit, but um, t like Taylor from last season was really lovely in reaching out and offering um, help with anything. Um, I've been to her house a few times. She's an amazing person, a very friendly and helpful. Um, Joseph as well and yeah. Tiffany. Oh, so yeah. um, quite a few, oh, and like, oh, gosh, there was, there's quite a few from other seasons, actually, and we all hung out. We had drinks together, and, yeah, so it's been really cool. People reaching out on, on Instagram and stuff, so that's cool. It's incredible. It is a very tight-knit family because I, as much as we can talk about it, until you've been in there, I truly think you just don't quite pick up mm. on, on what it's like. And it carries across other shows. I know Survivor folks, and there's Amazing Race folks and others that – uh, that I've talked to it. And I don't know if it's just because we have this shared experience or we're just all similar personalities in some way that we're just all talkers that like to hang out with people and, and all of that. Yeah. Th see, that's interesting. I thought about that. Like everyone, well, actually what I noticed was the people who got later in the game in their season um, were all people I really connected with. So like I've chatted with, Ky I've been hanging out with Kylan and Monty and they're, they're all really good people. And you're like, wow, I would have aligned with you in the house. Isn't that strange? Like, yeah, it, like I probably would have aligned with you in the house and it's oh just, yeah, we, you're the same personality, you know? Yeah. We could have worked well together, boy. We, we would have <laughs> done well. All right. I got a question from Ed. I'm pretty sure I know this, the answer to this, but I'm asking anyway, Ed Brewer is asking the wall comp. You threw that, didn't you? I certainly did. <laughs> I knew you did. There was no way you were coming off the wall so quick. I can't remember who came off and you were off right after them. And, and Blues. Thought, oh. Yeah. Oh. So I um, I thought what I'll try and with all the comps, try and get like in the sort of halfway mark. But everyone had dropped so, so that you don't look like you've thrown it and you don't look weak because you also can get voted off for being too weak. So sure. I was like fall somewhere in the middle, like with all the comps. So every week from the first comp on, like the first comp was really hard to throw because it was just walking on a beam and I was, I accidentally nearly got a decent time. So I was like, oh my God, this is a disaster. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, with the wall comp, I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm good with Jared. There's a chance he might put him up, he might put me up, but I think he's got bigger targets. Yeah. So I'm going to, as long as blue doesn't, isn't still up there, I'm going to, um, I'm just got to stay up past Blue because I thought Blue will put me out. Okay. And okay. I think she would have. So um, when Blue dropped, I was like, cool. And I jumped off because I was like, there's no way I'm winning this week. I'm not confident in my alliances at the moment. I don't have that strength. So to cover me for the week after when you win, you know. Well, it's funny because you won, I think you won three, week 10, and then a couple right there at the end as well. Yeah. And you are you won three out of the five of, of the women's, HOH wins. Yeah, did you go in thinking you were going to be the uh, the female comp beast there? Because I know you could have won a, a whole lot more even probably than than you won. Yeah, I'm um, super athletic, and um, so I figured any of the athletic comps I would be good at. 
Um, so I did go in there thinking I could win comps, but that I also told myself don't win the comps. Like I told my friends before I went in, I'm just so you know when you watch me, don't think I'm suddenly weak because <laughs> I'm going to be losing all these comps for the first half of the season. All right. <laughs> On my season, I got booted on week number four, day number 30, kicked out of the house. Fortunately, I won the battle back, so I was able to get back in. And at that point, I was like, I better win this next HOH or I could be heading right back out the door. So I won my HOH the same night I got booted. So it was talking about a a roller coaster. Same as Cam. Yeah. Same as Cam, right? Yeah, it was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it was incredible. Incredible night. From that point on, I felt like I was playing with house money. I'd made my mark in the game. No matter what, I felt like I'd done something. And then I went a little bit further. So that that was kind of... Oh, no, that's incredible. For that to happen and make it to fourth, that is like it's so hard to make it that far. It's, yeah. It, it is amazing when you first start in that house. Y'all start off with 17 people. Uh, so even one more than we had. That house feels so small. You can't go yeah. anywhere without people. Hanging out in the bathroom. I never knew why so many people hung out right oh. there toilet and all of that and the showers and then by the end when it was just you and and matt and and jag that house suddenly seems so quiet and so big and so empty it's such a such a weird trans transition from from start to finish uh, that we went through yeah and people are like oh you know felicia and sri you left them on on their own when there's only five in the house i'm like guys we're on separate alliances yeah. like there, there was a lot that we did do together and we said you know we're up in the room playing cards if you want to come up where you're most welcome to come up but like i was also was walking into rooms with felicia and she would refuse to speak to me for half an hour so you know mm-hmm. what am i going to do like so it's you're in alliances it's a game so you <laughs> it's hard by the time you get to that point people pretty much understand how people are positioned there's not a whole lot of of subtlety and secrets it doesn't seem like as you get towards the end uh, and you maybe don't want to talk strategy, but you also don't want to hear the same old stories that you've been hearing for the last 90 days, which tends to be the case also. Oh, did I lose you or did y'all lose me? <laughs> Let's see. Uh... <laughs> First technical glitch. Hold on a second, and uh, we'll see if we can't make this work. Huh. Okay. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm back. There. All right. <laughs> I might have been my internet, I think. Uh, who knows? I was, I was sitting here thinking, I don't know if it's you or me, and uh, it doesn't matter. I'm glad, glad to have you back. All right, Thank a couple you. more questions that we got on here. Uh, misfire, I uh, ask, and I don't know this. You did Big Brother Australia, uh, Big Brother US. Uh, you're a fan of it. Are you a fan of other reality shows, Survivor, Amazing Race? Uh, w- would you do, uh, and Misfire saying, would you do the challenge? Patricia Miller saying, would you consider doing the traders? I think you'd be great at the comps on there. Yeah, and you can hear me right now, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, I would. Lo- I love reality TV. In fact, I only ever want to watch reality TV. I'm just, um, I prefer, I love documentaries. I love reality shows. I even love the Kardashians. So there you go. <laughs> Dance Mums, the works. Like, I am reality TV. But yeah, I would love, I love The Amazing Race. I love the challenge. And Traders, I think I would be really good at Traders um, being a lawyer. So, um, and also, with yeah i just think i'd be really good at the strategy so but also the comps in the challenge that would be fun and i I love traveling so the amazing race i don't know there's so many yeah i'm the same way i would do any of them i've I've told a lot of people you better get me on one of those shows because otherwise i'm gonna have to default to naked and afraid and no one wants to see me on that reality (laughs) show (laughs) actually i was watching naked and afraid the other day and they do blur you out so i was like yeah i'm I'm not gonna do it but (laughs) the nudity wouldn't bother me at all it's the the sun and the insect access to areas that oh. I don't want them accessing. Well, that's what Sari was saying about um, Survivor. Like, there's just bugs everywhere. You get eaten alive. Like, it's pretty bad. Did you recognize Sari when you came into the house that first night? Did you know who she was from Survivor and all that? I, I, didn't I did not. Mm-mm. No, and I think I actually have watched one of her seasons, but I didn't realize, like, um, that. Yeah, but I knew within three seconds someone told me, and I was like, right. Um, I better align with her is what I thought. So, and also I knew about halfway through the season that she'd won traders. Okay. All right. Yeah. 
I would not have been happy. I, I, I didn't during my season. It turns out we had some people that knew each other outside the house and I wasn't happy about that. I wouldn't yes. have been real happy to have someone who came in with kind of special privilege or special situations like, like she had, but yeah, you, know, you, you work with what they give you. Right. Well, that's right. And look, so with the Jared, like with her son being in the house, that was like, that's just ridiculous to me, but, that was not an advantage, you know what I mean? Like that was because he was so sort of reckless in the way he yeah. played, it was a, such a disadvantage for her. So, um, yeah, I think I'd be interested to see what game she would have played. She probably wouldn't, it wouldn't have changed where she came, I don't think. But, yeah, because ultimately this comes down to comps towards the end. So Yeah, it is. Uh, I always tell people, if I just won one more comp, I think I could have made it to the very end, but yeah, what not happen. Well, that, right. that part one of the three-part comp at the end was absolutely freezing, and I was strong enough to hold on to that, but I was I had, like, hypothermia. I was shaking so much I couldn't yeah. hold on anymore. So, yeah, I wish, I wish I'd won that one, but anyway. <laughs> it was the, – the final three parts was tough. I, it kind of irritated me watching Jag and Matt doing rock, paper, scissors to see who was going to win it. That was – little more oh. confidence than than I want to see. For, I want people fighting every single day there in that house, and, and that yeah. wasn't the way I wanted to see it played. No, that's right. right. Haley Jones is saying, Bowie Jane, go into your show on Sunday. So excited to hear your set. So you've got a cross fan here already that's, that's excited to hear the music. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, my God. Make sure you come up and say hi. Um, Yes, Sunday the 31st of March at Glory LA. So, yes. All right. Well, you got someone that's excited. I, you got a lot of people, but one vocalizing this evening. Uh, Tracy Muckenfuss is saying, who do you miss the most from the house? Is there anyone oh. that you miss the most for the house? I mean, it's still very fresh. So I feel like we all still speak. I just interviewed Corey in America on my podcast. Okay. Um, and that's airing this Wednesday, Babes Behind the Beats. But like when I was chatting with them, I was like, oh, I miss Corey in America. It's like when you speak to them, you're like, oh, yeah. I think it's when you see them that you you miss them. So, um, and I've been chatting with Cameron. Cameron Red and I are going to organize a time to catch up. Same with Riley. So we're going to coordinate that in their neck of the woods. Now, that that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. I, that's a fun. I've seen Cameron out in, I don't know, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee or somewhere. Yeah. They, they look so, like they've been having fun. Yeah, uh, they asked me to go to that, but um, I, I, my brother's having a baby, so I, I couldn't go. But I will go to the next one for sure. I, I saw a picture that you posted. Uh, congratulations on being a yes. new aunt or having a new a new nephew. So congrats on that. Yes, uh, thank you. Nicole Anthony from my season just got married a couple weekends ago, and it was so great. She was up in Long Island. Uh, we got to go up, and it was her and myself and three or four other people from our season. So oh, that's good. For us to get together. And again, it is kind of a family deal. And some people take it personally and some people will never want to interact with certain people. But for the most part, I, I always treat the game's the game and real life's real life. And it's, it's like playing poker or something else. Once it's done, I, I try not to pay too much attention to what happened in the house. Oh and, yeah. I mean, it's silly. We're all thrown in that situation together. We should all be friends and getting along. But I even noticed that when, as soon as I got off stage, people from through the season were being a bit weird. So um, I was just like, wow, guys, this is a game. Like, you're the ones who keep saying it's a game. So I haven't actually done anything mean to anyone. So, um, and, but, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's And it's hopefully people now. mellow out as they, they have a little time to readjust the life in the outside world. And, and yeah, all that. And that I think so. Time. Yeah. Right. So Brian Hosteller saying, what, in your opinion, makes a, a good Big Brother player? Um, I, well, if you want to win or whether you want to be entertaining are two different things. If you want to win, Big Brother, I would say um, you have to be very careful for the first half of the season but also st put your building blocks in place. So I think you need to be making great connections. Um, I, I would have loved to have aligned with Corey in America from day one, but I just don't think that was ever going to happen. But we've, we've chatted about this afterwards and we could have gone – you know, right through the end together, I think. But, yeah, yeah. so I think build, getting your building blocks in place, um, being someone who's not too opinionated, you've got to be very careful till later in the game. And I say don't win too many comps unless you have to. Later yeah. in the game, you need to start winning, but not the start. I, I absolutely, yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's funny that you point out trying to win the game versus being the big 
entertaining type person. I know I got a lot of grief when I was HOH for not making a huge move. I kind of, there was a diamond power veto. My power kind of got stolen. So I did a compromise and people were mad that I didn't burn the big alliance. And it's like, at this point, it's still all about the survival. Yeah, I would have made a huge splash in terms of Big Brother on TV and all of that, but I would have been gone the next week. It's just, yeah. You know, You've got That's to watch right. out for yourself while you're in there. And sometimes that doesn't always make for the best TV. It's just the way you play the game. No, that's right. Like, but you want to be entertaining. Um, it's probably you. Pro like, if you want to be blowing things up all the time, you're going to be gone. So yeah. <laughs> here's what I thought was interesting. When I think about your season, I was getting ready for this. And I see so many similarities between your season, uh, the way you played the game and Holly from my season and Holly was uh, she ended up coming in second place she made it to the final two and then didn't didn't win at the end but you never got nominated uh which is incredible i, I was on the block six times so we had a very different experience but, <laughs> yeah. but you never you never got nominated i think holly wasn't nominated until there were like the final three and there was no one left to, to nominate her right uh and, and her showman's actually had to put her up so she basically was just just right there towards the end uh, and I, I feel like in a lot of ways, she had some of the same issues that you did uh, or quality. I mean, it's pros and cons. She played a great game, but there were times where people, and I don't think the jury necessarily always respected the game that she played because she played such a good game that she was never under severe threat, that she yeah. always was, she was always in a pretty good position. And so I don't know that people always gave her as much credit as the guy who won. Yeah. Who several times, if he hadn't won HOH, he probably would have been out the door. So he was very much more at risk. And, and so in a lot of ways, she played such a great game that she didn't get the recognition at the end because she didn't have as many of the big resume moves uh, that happened. And I kind of felt like you were almost getting in that same situation as well, yeah. where it was hard for us to tell how much. And you talk about planting seeds with Felicia and others. It was hard for us to tell how much the jury was maybe recognizing some of your power moves. Uh, versus not necessarily seeing what you had done because you did such a good job of never being under threat as much as some of the other people. Well, that was going to be my speech for the final two. It was going to be, guys, I was never nominated. You had no idea I was playing the game. I was That was 100% how I was going to open it. So, um, and, and just talk about the fact that um, that means I knew how to, like I pivoted when I was blindsided. I was just going to go through all of that and, um, yeah, it is tricky because you do have to plant seeds that you've had a strategy um, to get back to the jury. But on the other hand, um, that can work against you as well. So it's just such a funny little game. I tell you what. It's, it's crazy. All right. I want I want to make a little transition right now because we, we're running, uh, running out of time a little bit. And I want to make sure I talk about your music. You mentioned that you're doing a show on, on Sunday. Uh, I know that you've got a, a new song coming out on Friday as well. Uh, and I certainly want to give you a lot of time to, uh, uh, or a little bit of time, uh, to talk about your music side of it and some, some of what you're doing with that. Uh-oh. Did I, did I lose you? All right. We'll see if she comes back. But in the meanwhile, guess what I got, guys? I got some banners. Uh, Bo oh, there you are. Sorry. No, I, no, I just, right. my battery was running out. I quickly plugged it in. Um, okay. okay, yes, my music. So is that what you want? Yeah, to talk yeah. About? I just want to make yeah. sure we get a chance to plug what you're you're up to because some of us do Big Brother, then we go back just to regular life. You're still carrying that celebrity status, doing your DJing <laughs> and music and new songs and all that. Yeah, so um, I've obviously been in entertainment for a long, long time. I've been a singer before I was a DJ and performed in bands and all that kind of stuff, bands, duos all around the world. Um, the last 10 years or 12 years I've been DJing and doing dance music and um, I have a track coming out on Friday called Never Surrender. And now I wrote this and recorded this before Big Brother in Sweden on one of my songwriting trips, but I tell you what, the lyrics actually apply to Big Brother and I didn't even realized it at the time but when I got out I was like oh my god I've got to release Never Surrender like it's all about come on pressure don't be shy take me to the other side like <laughs> um so yeah it's funny that um just the timing of that but yeah I'm really excited but this is one of my favorite tracks that I've been sitting on 
And um, yeah, so the producer's in Sweden. And um, so it'll come out on Friday. The pre save link is there, everyone. There you go. Yeah, um, there. <laughs> there. Yeah, um, I'm DJ Boring Jane on Instagram and TikTok. So it's also in my link tree if you get stuck. But um, let's just keep it on loop so that we can chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations. I, I've been listening to your music on Spotify f- for the last week. And uh, I guess a couple of songs, just you know, a whole lot of different versions of it. It's pretty cool. It's got the beat in my head now. And Spotify is throwing out all kinds of new suggestions to me as a result. In, oh, that's, in addition I've, to country music. So <laughs> I've mucked up your algorithms. No, I, I, <laughs> hey, I had my phases. I was maybe a little, little before the, the, the music you do, but Depeche Mode and or OMD and some, some of the yeah, bands cool. back in the day. Uh, but no, I, was, I, I love the songs that you've done. I'm looking forward to this one as well. So yeah, I went ahead and did post the uh, uh, link to, to that one. I'll put it in the show notes as well. And then as far as I think you said Instagram and TikTok is DJ yeah. Bowie Jane. So so that's that's there as well. Yeah, so. that's right. Um, so, yeah, and I've got the gig on the 31st of March in L.A. It's at Glory L.A. And um, I'm playing at UCLA on the 12th of April. So um, they're just the things in the instant future that are coming up. I don't know how you do it. So how how once you got back, I mean, it's such a weird you were in a house just with there for the last week just with two other people and suddenly now you're in front of thousands of people doing the DJing and all of that and, and just masses of people squeezed in talking about a transition rather quickly from one one extreme to the other yeah well I think that because we had to clear our calendar and because we came out of the house at a strange time um yeah. it was like a month before I did gigs okay. so um and that was a good adjusting period but like I had half the cast stay at my house and um in hindsight, I don't know if that, like, really, you want to be with them all still, but, like, it kind of also was no quiet time. So I think um, I would advise maybe having some quiet time, <laughs> at least not having everyone stay in the, you know, everyone's, like, in your bed and on the floor and, oh, my God, it's crazy. So. It was, yeah, I, I love my fellow castmates, but once I got out of the house, a lot of them went to Vegas I said, man, I just need some quiet time. I, I grabbed the the family and did some stuff there around LA and, and all of that. Your yeah, parents just, came to, the, to yeah. the final, didn't they? That was cool. Yeah, they did. So, like, I came out on stage, and that's why I was, like, A, you know, I'd mentally prepared for, look, if you, you don't get picked, blah, blah, I suspected that that might happen. Um, and so as soon as I got out on stage, I'm like, well, it's over. So, um, and then I looked in the audience. I'm like, oh, my God, my parents are here from Australia. <laughs> I couldn't believe it's not like they said, Oh, look, there's your parents. I just looked and was like, What? <laughs> oh, I bet they were so excited to, to watch your, your whole journey. Were they surprised you made it on the show, or did they just say, Oh, that's typical? Uh, that's I our think, daughter. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a bit of like, Oh, she's doing another crazy thing. Like, I've done a few crazy things in my life. So, even moving to America, obviously, is a bit left yeah. of center. You know, I've, I've left my hometown. So, um, yeah, and home country, like, it's completely different here. But, yeah. So I think they're used to these crazy things, but they're like, oh, don't do another show. It's too stressful. <laughs> uh, I get that. Hey, life life is short. I'll never turn down an opportunity. And I, oh, I'm yes, incredibly I grateful I got to do it. And and Bojan, I'm incredibly grateful that you, that you came on this evening. We'll have to shut it down at that point. But uh, thank you. I, I appreciate yeah. so much. And uh, again, uh, music coming out, new song on Friday. And, and I will post that in the show notes. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for everyone who's been watching and writing their questions in. Yeah, I really appreciate being on the show with a fellow big brother buddy. That's right. Hey, when you come to Houston, oh, anywhere in Texas, I'll I'll pop up and I'll be the one waving the cowboy hat as you as you do your DJing up. Yes, we'll um, we'll have some uh, beverages in the green room. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And that that's all <laughs> I need is a feel that beat just a little bit more. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, boy, Jane. But thank oh, that's you, awesome. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll go ahead and sh- shut down the show as well, guys. Big old SKD 143. Love my wife, love my kids, love reality fans. Uh, Bowie Jane, thank you so much. Happy Easter to all of y'all. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please a uh, thumbs up uh, on the, the broadcast, please. And uh, notifications, and, and please consider subscribing to my channel. We're going to bring in some more guests, but they are going to match up to Bowie Jane. Thank you, Bowie. And uh, <laughs> thank you so uh, much. Happy Easter to all of y'all. And we will be back next Monday and uh, we'll talk all about Easter eggs and all that then. Till then, guys, y'all have a great one. Cheers, my friends.